So welcome. To this morning, we are together about to leave Mount Sinai. So if you'll turn, the Parsha begins, it's not so, which you'll find, it's the longest Parsha in the book. Uh, 791. Page 791, if you have one. If you don't have a red book, don't worry. It's okay, because we're only going to look at it for a few moments, okay? So 791, it's not so. It's the longest portion of the book. And it's the Torah portion directly before we leave Mount Sinai. So to give the, the narrative again, we exited Egypt, crossed the Red Sea, two weeks, two months in the desert, arrived at Mount Sinai, spent two years at Mount Sinai listening to God's Torah, uh, gaining all of the instructions for living the holy life, building the Mishkan, preparing for the conquest of Canaan. And in next week's Torah portion, so you have to come back, um, we're going to leave Mount Sinai and begin the journey. That is, the narrative has been suspended now for a book and a half, for, all of the, se for the second half of Exodus, all of Leviticus, and the first section of Bamidbar. And now the narrative is going to pick up next week. So this is the last section before we leave Mount Sinai. And it feels that way. It begins with an accounting of the, um, accounting of the, of the priestly class, of the Levites and the priests, and what their responsibilities will be on the march. Okay, the irony is that the word naso, which is the name of the Torah portion, means a number of things. It can mean count up. And that's how it's used in the first sentence of the Torah portion. God says to Moses, count up the Gershonites, the Merarites, and the Karahites, the, the various families of the Kohanim, and assign to them each of their responsibilities. The word naso also means to schlep. It means to lift and carry something. Because each of these priestly families is going to be given a responsibility to literally carry one piece of the holy uh, accoutrements, right? Every family carries its own stuff. Everybody has their own baggage. But this is the family that has the baggage of all of Israel. They're going to have to carry the pieces of the shrine, carry the pieces of the, uh, of the worship center all together. And someone has to schlep this stuff. So that's what the beginning of the Torah portion is about. The end of the Torah portion, the very last part, is, is the gifts brought by each of the tribal heads to the Mishkan. So when the Mishkan, the tabernacle, is finished, each of the, they have a dedication ceremony. Long speeches, hors d'oeuvres, the whole shmir. And, and each of the heads of the tribes bring something, they, and they all bring the same thing. Imagine that. They all showed up to the party and brought the same house gift. It's amazing. And they, all, and they bring the same thing, and that's what the end of the Torah portion is. The middle of the Torah portion is a potpourri of laws having to do with things you've got to know before we leave. Oh yeah, one more thing, right? And, and most of them have to do with situations which would destroy the social cohesion of the community. So how do you preserve the soul? We know we're about to leave the mountain. And we're about to enter back into the, to the, into the journey toward the land. And then we're going to take up the task of conquering the land. How do we preserve social cohesion during this journey? And so what are the threats to social cohesion? One of the threats to social cohesion is antisocial behavior. So you get this thing right away after the census. It says, it, look at page 793. If you have it, if you don't have it, just listen. <laughs> Chapter 5. The Lord said to Moses, instruct the Israelites to remove from camp anyone with an eruption or a discharge. And then you know, the next paragraph is, speak to the Israelites when a man or woman commits any wrong to a fellow, breaking faith with God. Here's what he does. I mean, see, these are the things that break social cohesion. You have to have a mechanism for somehow absorbing antisocial behavior and reestablishing the connection to the community. Because if the community lines up in factions, yes, he did, no, he didn't, yes, he did, then you're going to end up with a mess. So this is all about social cohesion. And then they start, they put in a couple of interesting laws, which are laws which deal with this, you know, stem from this same question of social cohesion. There's a very, we did this one last year, so I'm not going to do it in depth now, but it's the question of what happens when a guy suspects his wife of infidelity. Now, what I'm suggesting is that the context here suggests that the problem for the, for the, for the Torah is not just a guy suspects his wife of infidelity. The problem is that her family 
is going to line up with her and say, she's pure, and his family will line up with him and say, she's impure, and you're going to end up with a war in the middle of the people. I don't know how many of you might, by accident, happen to have divorced friends. But when somebody gets divorced, they end up splitting the whole social world. Who becomes her friends and who becomes his friends. And it's very hard to cross over. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah. Right? It's very hard because they, people line up that way. And so that's what the Torah is worried about. Like how, do you, how do you preserve the social cohesion of these people under the circumstances of normal life? And so there's a procedure. We're not going to get into it today. We did it last year. It's a very strange, mystical, weird way of dealing with an accusation of adultery. Unlike today, when you simply put it in the National Enquirer and things like that. <laughs> or, as Congressman Hastert would do, you just pay $50,000 a month to keep it quiet. Um, I'm not being political. I don't know what party he belongs to. I know what party he belongs to. It's a party I, we'd all like to get into at one point. Now, the, here's the section I want to deal with today, and it's suggested by the Haft Torah. So you know that every Torah portion of the, of the book is accompanied by a section of the biblical prophets called the Haftorah. Haftorah, the word Haftorah doesn't mean half of the Torah. The word Haftorah means the closing section. So when we finish the Torah, we then close the section of scriptural reading with a section of the prophets. And that way, every Shabbos morning, if you come to Shul for a year, you'll read through the entire Torah and a large corpus of the biblical prophets. The Haftorah, the Haftorah, the prophetic section for this Shabbos of Nassau is about the birth of a very, very strange biblical character by the name of Samson. The birth of Samson. And the reason why it's about the birth of Samson is because Samson belongs to a very small class of Israelites called Nazarites. Naz Nizirim. And, and the, the law of the Nazarite is given in this Torah portion. So let's look at the law of the Nazarite for a moment. Then what I really want to do is look at Samson because he's too juicy not to enjoy, okay? The, 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 there's, a, there's a set of movies on television. If you want a good commentary on the story of Samson, just for the fun of it, um, there's a set of really bad movies. Now, remember, I like, uh, th this, this, I like good movies, and I don't like bad movies, but I like good bad movies. <laughs> you know what I mean by good bad movies? Yeah. Bad movies, but they're good bad movies. So there is a set of really good, bad movies called The Expendables, which is very ironic. It's about a whole bunch of ex-CIA guys who were recruited to do these missions around the world. And the funny thing about it is it's all of the characters are ex, um, are, are ex like, like superhero movie stars that can't get parts anymore. <laughs> Sylvester Stallone, Arnold Schwarzenegger, Jason Strahan, uh, Jet Li, you know, Bruce Willis, all of these like guys that are now over the hill to play action stars because they're too old, you know, they're like a little paunchy and a little saggy and it's taken a lot of makeup and a lot of girdles to make them look good in tight t-shirts. And, 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 and so the, it's not only the expendables in terms of the characters, it's the expendables in terms of the actors, right? <laughs> It was, a fun, it was a way of providing a pension for all these guys, right? Nebuch, Sylvester Stallone, should have to live on what he made on the Rocky movies, so we'll make one more set of movies so he can have something to eat, you know? <laughs> you, so you know if these movies, so if you want to understand the Samson stories, you got to watch The Expendables, because it's a whole, and you'll see in a moment, it's a whole interesting meditation on what it means to be, and I quote, a real man, <laughs> unquote, okay? We'll get to that in just a second. Take two minutes, though. Let me read you the Law of the Nazarite. This is a very strange thing. It's, it's, not a, it's, it's on page 799, chapter 6. If you don't have a book, I'm going to read it out loud. Don't worry. Right? The Lord spoke to Moses, saying, there's no context to this. I, like it's out of the blue. Speak to the Israelites and say to them, if anyone, man or woman, explicitly utters a Nazarite vow, now, what a strange sentence. If anybody explicitly utters a Nazarite vow, which means that the Torah assumes you already know what a Nazarite is and what a Nazarite vow is. That is, you, you, this is not being given to initiated institution. This is being given to regulated institution that already exists. Does that hear, you everybody hear that? Right? If anybody explicitly utters a Nazarite vow, and here it defines that, to set himself apart for the Lord. 
he, he, he's got religious fervor and he wants to be set apart. How shall he do it? Here's the regulation. He shall abstain from wine or any other intoxicant. He shall not drink vinegar of wine or any other intoxicant. Neither shall he drink anything in which grapes have been steeped or even eat fresh grapes or dried grapes, raisins. So number one, if you're going to be a Nazarite, you give up wine. wine. You give up booze, right. This is 12 steps, right? Okay. <laughs> Throughout his term as a Nazarite, he may not eat anything made from grapes. Number two, throughout the term of his Nazarite, no razor shall touch his head. It shall remain consecrated until the completion of term as a Nazarite, the hair of his head being left to grow untrimmed. Okay, so the second element is? Don't cut your hair. Third element, ready? Throughout the term that he set apart for the Lord, he shall not go in where there is a dead person. Even if his father, mother, brother, sister should die, he must not defile himself for them, since hair set apart for God is upon his head. Throughout his term as a Nazarite, he is consecrated to the Lord. So, three rules of the Nazarite. If you want to be a Nazarite, apparently the idea is your motivation is to, is to give up certain things as a way of showing your affiliation with God. What do you do? You give up wine, haircuts, and funerals. That's my question. Like, what do wine, haircuts, and funerals... I mean, I would give up, you know, ice cream, you know, you know, things like, you know... Television, you know, Game of Thrones, you, you know, something like that. But no, wine, haircuts. Now, I'm going to come back to that in a minute. Here, now, here's the interesting thing. The rabbis of, who, of the Talmud who read this wondered the following. Is being a Nazarite something recommended? Is this something we should all aspire to? Is it, is it, a, is it a mark of distinction? Oh, wow, he's a Nazarite. Is it something tolerated? All right, you want to be a Nazarite, this is how you do it. You know, as my mother used to say, Gesundheit, you know. If that's what you want to do, do it. Or is this something actually being condemned? Now, why would you think that? Listen to the end, okay? Um, okay, is it a All right, if a person dies suddenly near him, defiling him, he shall shave his head. On the eighth day, he brings two... So, when... when uh, da, da. This is the ritual for the Nazarite, verse 13. On the day that his term as a Nazarite is completed. So, Nazarite status is not lifelong. It's only for a per period of time. So you say, for the summer of 2015, I'm a Nazarite. Okay? So on Labor Day, this is what you do when the summer's over, right? He shall be brought to the entrance to the tent of meeting. He comes to the shrine. As his offering to the Lord, he will present one male lamb in its first year without blemish, burnt offering, one ewe lamb without, um, for a purification offering, and a ram without blemish for an offering of well-being, a basket of unleavened cakes of choice flour, etc., and the priest shall present them. Now, the rabbis ask the following question. The basket of well-being, I understand. He's completed his vow. The basket of uh, the, 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 offering, the offering for a... Um, the, the first offering... It's in a meaning of offering without blemish, a burnt offering, one ewe lamb. That one, it's the purification offering. It's a sin offering. Why is the Nazarite offering a sin offering? I understand why he's doing one for well-being. He's thankful that he got through the, th he, he did it. Why is he offering a sin offering? So here you get the debate. So some of the rabbis of the Talmud said, he's offering, he's, he's right over here. Faith, he's right over here. Right. You okay? Good, okay. Nice. Shabbat shalom. Um, I saw that Harvey died this week. I'm, I'm very sorry for your loss. I know he's very precious to you. Um, the the, the, the well-being offering represents that he's finished his term as a Nazarite. Why does he offer a sin offering? Now, so some of the rabbis say he offers a sin offering because the reason he became a Nazarite, it's like person people in 12-step, is because his lifestyle beforehand was so profligate, he was such a sinner beforehand, that this is his way of cleansing himself. So he's apologizing for the life he lived before. Eh, not so good. The second reason the rabbis say is because in case he made any mistakes while he was a Nazarite, this covers up the mistake. He accidentally, you know, drank a case of wine, you know? <laughs> so, so I, he, he wasn't thinking, and it had, this is an apology, right? But the most interesting one, the rabbis say, is that this is the, the, the rabbis reading this, or the, the rabbis of the Talmud reading this said, this is the Bible's rather unsubtle way of saying, don't do this. 
The sin is you're given life in the world and you rejected it. You rejected it. That the Nazarite is not something to be encouraged. It's not even something to be mostly tolerated. It's something to be condemned. And this is the way of condemning it. Could go back with me for a minute. Wine, right? It's not wine, chocolate, and meat, which is what you think it would be. It's wine, haircuts, and death. Now think of these three things for a minute. Wine, let's hold on. That's easy to see. Haircuts. I'm going to make a suggestion here, right? Anyone have orthodox relatives who cover their hair? An uh, orthodox woman shaves her head when she gets married, wears a shaitel, or covers her hair with a tichel. Why does she cover her hair with a tichel? To not be attracted to somebody else. The hair represents sexuality. This is the Bible's euphemistic way of saying you're to be celibate. It's celibacy. That's what the haircut is. It's, it's the hair is the denial of sexuality. So you deny yourself wine, you deny yourself sexuality, and the third piece is to deny yourself participation in the rites associated with death. Now think about these three things for a moment. Wine, sex, and death. Sounds like a Woody Allen movie, doesn't it? <laughs> right? What do wine, sex, and death all have to do with each other? They're all experiences of ecstasy. Ecstasy meaning ecstasis, that which takes you out of your normal state of mind. Wine takes you out of your normal state of mind. Sexuality takes you out of your normal state of mind. Death takes you out of your normal state of mind. These are the things, of, these are the things that represent the, the elements of, of daily life, of the elements of ecstasy that are built into daily life. Now, what do we Jews do with these things normally? What's the normal procedure of the rabbinic tradition or the biblical tradition in dealing with these things? Are you allowed to drink wine in Judaism? Yes. 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 Not only are you allowed to do it, you're encouraged to do it, but under what circumstance? Wine becomes kiddush. Wine becomes kiddush. Kiddush means holiness. Wine is the symbol of happiness, joy, the bonding of a community, a moment of celebration, and the wine becomes the symbol of the sanctification of the circle of people around the table. You raise the glass of wine and you make kiddush. You have wine at a wedding. You have wine at a bris. Right? I guess you have wine at a bar mitzvah, but not if you're 13. You have wine at, at moments of simcha. You have wine. Wine becomes the symbol of joy. Joy in life. All right? Sexuality. Allowed in Judaism? Yes. yes. Under what circumstances? When it becomes the symbol, see? Not for its own sake, but a symbol of the sanctification of a relationship. The word for the sanctification of a relationship is kiddushin. You put a ring on the other person's finger and you say, Hareat mikudeshet li. Hareat mikudeshet. You are bound to me. You are bonded to me. You are sanctified. We are sanctified together in this relationship. And sexual pleasure, sexual play, sexual joy is a mitzvah. It's encouraged. It's mandatory, actually, as a, way, as a symbol of the joy of two people who share life together. How about death? Is death something to be shunned? In Jewish life? No. no. You, go, you, you, you attend to the dead, you care for the dead, you protect the dead, and what do you call the group of people who are closest to the body and taking care of the body and preparing it for death? You call them Hevra Kadisha. These are the elements of holiness because you take the, the ecstasis, you take the, the, these elements of moving us out of the world and you sanctify them in the bonds of community. So here's a guy who comes along and says, I don't want anything to do with this stuff. I mean, either he says, I can't handle it. Because if I get into wine, I go out of this world altogether. Right? Or I can't handle sexuality. Or I can't handle death. Or more than that, he says, I, I want to find God somewhere else. I want to find God on my own. I, I don't want to find God in the family, in the, at the table, in the community that's, that, that mourns and grieves and grows together. It's a, it's a very interesting, and I think the rabbis are right. The rabbis condemned this guy. Now, all of that was just by way of introduction. Now we get to the important part. The most famous Nazir ever was Samson. And the, his birth story is the Haftorah. There comes along an angel to the, to, the, to the wife of this guy, Manoah, and tells him that the son you're about to have is going to be a Nazir. So that's really strange, because we read in there that, that Nazir... To be a Nazir is to be, is to make a promise to yourself. It's to make a vow. How could somebody be a Nazir from birth? 
right? It's, he's a little bit off. It's already a weird thing, right? Now, where does this story occur? Really quickly. Um, in the Hebrew Bible, we finished the five books of Moses. At the very end of the five, I'll give you a preview of coming attractions. At the very end of the five books of Moses, the very end of Deuteronomy, we're at the border of Eretz Yisrael. Moses dies. You turn the page. Joshua takes us into the land. Joshua conquers the land of Israel, settles the tribes, and then Joshua dies. What happens next? There's 200 years between the death of Joshua and the rise of King David, when there's no government. Everyone's, every, we live in tribal in tribes. We're governed by tribal law, elders of the tribe, and there's no central government. And then what happens eventually is then a new enemy comes called the Philistines, and that the Philistines challenge the autonomy of, of Israel, and the, and the Israelites have to gather together and form a federal government with a king who can expel the, the Philistines. That period is called the time of the judges. The book in Hebrew, the book in the Bible is called the book of Judges. Judges is Shoftim. Judges is the wrong word. They really weren't judges in the sense of, you know, Wapner, you know, um, <laughs> Joe. You know, they, 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 what, what they were was chieftains. They were charismatic warriors who would rise up in order to expel invaders. There was no set army. There was no set structure. There was no set government. It's a lot like the 13 colonies of the American Revolution, right? When you had 13 colonies, you couldn't expel the British. You could only expel the British when the 13 colonies came together and formed a confederation and then eventually a constitution and eventually the United States of America, right? And, and there was a lot of tension there because some of the colonies didn't want to join the Union. So we had a civil war afterwards because the colonies of the South didn't want to be governed by Washington. And even today, you know, the state of Texas still doesn't think of itself as part of America, right? Not that I'm being political or anything. Now, the book of Judges is a piece of political propaganda written by the Davidic kings in order to justify their federal government. The book of Judges in the Bible is to the Bible what the Federalist Papers was to the American Constitution. It was the justification for the unification of the kingdom into one. And each of, because each of the stories of the judges shows you a leader who is more unlikely, and it ends, with the, it ends with the words, and that's what happens when you don't have a king. In fact, the last line of the book of Judges is, and so kids, that's what happens when you don't have a king. In the end of the book of Judges, close to the end, it's the second to the last story, is the story of Samson, the weirdest Jewish hero ever. And I want to take a look at this with you because I, 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 I think it says something really interesting. So I gave you a sheet. Everyone got my sheet? The birth story of Samson is today's Haftorah. Okay? The adventures of Samson I put on this one sheet. Now I edited it down just a little bit. I took out some of the stuff, but I left in all the juicy parts, right? So take a look with me. If you didn't get one, just share with somebody cute or listen, okay? So Samson grows up in the tribe of Dan. The tribe of Don lives in the south of Israel. Well, they're split. Half live in the south, half live in the north. And they border, they border on what today would be the Gaza Strip. During the time of the judges, a tribe of Greeks left Attica, sailed across the Mediterranean, landed in Tyre, and migrated southward and formed a colony in the southwest corner of Israel. They're called the Philistines. The Philistines are Greeks. They had five cities, Ashkelon, Ashdod, Gaza, Ekron, and Gat. Gat is the hometown of Goliath. Okay, he's Goliath of God, right? Ashkelon you can visit today as an Ashdod, and you'll see a lot of excavation of Philistine encampments. Gaza, I don't recommend you go to, right? <laughs> but if you did ever one day want to go there, you could, all, if it's not being bombed, you can also see uh, excavations of Philistine um, encampments. Now, the, 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 the Philistines created a colony, a large colony there, and they began to encroach, they began to move westward, uh, eastward into Israelite territory. Into Israelite territory. Now, this is going to be the reason why we end up with a king, because the, 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 the Philistines had a couple of things we didn't have. One, they had iron. 
This is the end of the Bronze Age. Everybody's weapons and armor is made out of bronze. The <clears throat> Philistines were Greeks. They knew how to smelt iron. If you have an iron-tipped arrow and you shoot someone wearing bronze armor, what happens? You kill the dude, right. It's, it's an escalation in warfare. Number two, they had chariots. The Israelites didn't have chariots yet. They had chariots. Now, the, 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 the Bible is anachronistic when it says that Pharaoh chased Moses with chariots because that did, they didn't come till much later. Chariots did to warfare what the tank did in the First World War. It upped the ante of warfare. And the third thing that the Philistines had was a mutual defense pact among the five cities so that if anyone was attacked, the other four would come and attack, would, would attack them. So they were very, very powerful people. And they bring into, into Israel Greek culture. And you'll hear this in a moment. The great Greek hero is Hercules, who is related to the sun. He's a sun god. He's a semi-god, demigod, right? The, the character here, his name is Shimshon, from the word Shemesh. Shemesh, Shimshon, the sun god. Oh, get it? You hear it? And he's going to be down. I'm going to give you the end of the story. He's going to be taken down by a woman named Delilah. Lila means nighttime. Get it? So it's very likely that the Shimshon stories were affected by Philistine mythology as well, because they really don't sound Taka Jewish. And that's what I want to get to. Right? So look, look at me for a minute. Think Sylvester Stallone, right? Once, this is right after his birth story, once Samson went down to Timna, which is one of the villages in the southwest corner of Israel that had been taken over by the Philistines. It was, a pal it was an Israelite city taken over by the Philistines. In Timnah, he noticed a girl among the Philistine women. Upon his return, he told his father and mother, I noticed one of the Philistine women in Timnah. Please get her for me for a wife. <laughs> his mother and father say just what any Jewish mother and father would say. <laughs> right? Is there no one among the daughters of your own kinsmen, among your own people, that you have to go and take a wife from the uncircumcised Philistines? <laughs> you couldn't find a Jewish girl? <laughs> you had to go take one of them? You couldn't find a Jewish girl? Go on J-date, for God's sakes. You know? <laughs> go, go to Pico Robertson. You know, go to Aish. You'll find a Jewish girl, for God's sake. But Samson answered, get me that one, for she is the one that pleases me. His father and mother did not realize this was the Lord's doing. Now, that's the editor's, that's the editor's comments. He didn't know this was a plot. Right? What do they see? My, my son is dating one of them, right? You know? He was seeking a pretext against the Philistines. So Samson and his father and mother went down to Timnah. When he came to the vineyards of Timnah for the first time, a full-grown lion came roaring at him. There are lions in Israel, by the way. In those days, there, were, there are two, even today. It's like here. They live in the hills, but when there's a drought, they come down into the valley. You know there's a lion living out here in Silmar someplace? Is it? What? what? Yeah, they have names for that, but they, you know, he's eating tourists, so it's okay. Um, <laughs> Welcome to the Grauman's Chinese. <laughs> <laughs> I think you've got to have guts to visit L.A. You know? <laughs> the spirit of the Lord gripped him, and he tore him asunder with his bare hands, as one might tear a kid asunder. But he didn't tell his father and mother what he did. Then he went down and spoke to the woman, and she pleased Samson. So he, a lion comes at him, and what is his impulse? Tear the lion to bits. Woo! <laughs> That's a Jewish boy, right? <laughs> right? He didn't tell his parents. He goes and returns the woman, right? He, 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 he courts the woman, right? Returning the following year to marry her, he, look, he, he turned aside to look at the remains of the lion. In the lion's skeleton, he found a swarm of bees and honey. He scooped it up into his palm and ate as, long, and, as he went along. And when he rejoined his father and mother, he gave them some and they ate, but he didn't tell them where they found it. <laughs> so his father and mother came down to the woman. Samson made a feast there as young men used to do. When they saw him, that's the, the, the countrymen of this woman. They designated 30 companions to be with him. So this large beastly man shows up in the Philistine village, and the elders of the village get worried. So what do they do? They assign like a bodyguard to him. You know, oh, it's okay. These will be your groomsmen, right? Yeah. right they're afraid, what are they afraid of? They're afraid he's going to destroy the village, right? Which he's going to in a minute. Samson said to them, let me propound a riddle to you. This is, I mean, this is like, a, like a drinking game, right? If you can give me the right answer during the seven days of the feast, I'll give you 30 linen tunics and 30 sets of clothes. I'll take you to men's warehouse. You can have a feast. <laughs> but if you're not able to, you give, me, you give me 30 linen tunics and 30 sets of clothes. That's I mean, it's a weird story. I mean, like, what's going on? And he said to all right, ask the riddle. 
So he said, out of the eater came something to eat, out of the strong came something sweet. Okay? For three days they couldn't answer the riddle. Anyone ever read Greek mythology? There are riddles in Greek mythology, right? Remember the riddle of, what was it, the Thebes? The Sphinx, the riddle of the Sphinx, right? I mean, there are these kinds of, this is a Greek kind of story, right? Well, On the, one, other, one other thing is that in the legend of Hercules, he, he defeats a lion also. Yeah. He wears the lion skin. And we're going to get to that in a minute, yeah. He comes walking around with this lion skin talus, you know, right? <laughs> On the, it made it, they didn't want to give him an Aaliyah, you know, because he <laughs> On the seventh day, they said to him, coax, they said to Samson's wife, coax your husband to provide us with the answer to the riddle, else we shall put you and your father's house to the fire, and you've invited us here to impoverish us. So Samson's wife harassed him with tears. So this is going to be his pattern, right? He falls in with these women who he desires, who then try to manipulate him, okay? You really hate me, don't you? <laughs> he said, <laughs> you don't love me. You asked my countrymen a riddle. You didn't tell me the answer. I think we had to do this in a sort of whiny voice, right? Okay, he replied, I haven't even told my mother and father, shall I tell you? During the rest of the seven days, she continued to harass him with tears. This must have been a hell of a honeymoon, right? <laughs> and on the seventh day, he told her because she nagged him so. And she explained the riddle to the countrymen. On the seventh day before sunset, the townsman said to him, what's sweeter than honey and what is stronger than a lion? And he responded, had you not plowed with my heifer, you wouldn't have guessed my riddle. So he, oh, right. And what happened? The spirit, now watch the next slide. So what, what does he do that he's been manipulated? The spirit of the Lord gripped him. He went down to Ashkelon and killed 30 of its men. Well, you know, you get angry. This is what you do. He stripped them and gave them the sets of clothes to those who answered the riddle. So where did he get the clothing from? He killed 30 guys and swiped their shirts, right? He left in a rage for his father's house. Samson's wife then went and married one of those who had been the wedding companions. This is a strange story. So sometime later in the season, Samson came to visit his wife. Right? He, go, he comes back to visit her, bringing a kid as a gift. He said, let me go to the chamber of my wife. The father wouldn't let him go. I was sure that you disliked her, so I gave her to one of your wedding companions. But her younger sister is more beautiful than she is. <laughs> let her become your wife. Thereupon Samson said, now the Philistines have no claim against me for the harm I shall do to them. Samson went and caught 300 foxes. He took torches, turned the fox tails to tail. He placed a torch between each of the tails. He lit the torches and turned the foxes loose among the standing grain of the Philistines, setting fire to the stacked grain, standing grain, vineyards, and olive trees. So, so what does he do? Out of revenge, because they took away his wife, he burns all their food. What kind of Jewish hero is this? <laughs> like, what are you, you, you getting a picture of who this man is? Right? And then they say, who is this? It was Samson's son-in-law, the Timnite who took Samson's wife and gave her to the wedding companion. Thereupon the Philistines came up and put her and her father's house to the fire. It's a hell of a story. Samson said to them, if that's how you act, I will not rest till I take in revenge. He gave them a sound and thorough thrashing, and he went out and stayed in a cave in Aton. And they go, they, go, they go after him, and they try to catch him. There's a whole story. They try three times to catch him. They, they bind him in ropes, and they bind him in chairs. They can't catch him. He's too strong. And that's the end of that part of the story. All right, now chapter two of Samson. Everybody get a picture of who this man is? Chapter two. Once Samson went to Gaza, and he met a whore and slept with her. The Gazans learned that Samson had come there, so they gathered and lay ambush, right? The whole town lay at the night, and all night long they kept whispering to each other, when daylight comes, we'll kill him. But Samson lay in bed only till midnight, and at midnight he got up, grasped the doors of the town, like the gates of the city. He pulls up the gates of the city with two gate posts and pull them out by the bar and place them on his shoulder and carry them to the top of a hill near Hebron. Wow. So, so what do we get here? What, what's your image of this guy? He's a brute, right? And he has two speeds, right? Either he's, either he's taking women or he's killing men. Remember, Freud had this idea that there are two elements to libido. Libido is the life energy in a human being. And Freud said that there's two elements. One is eros and one is thanatos. That at, at heart, human beings have, our, human beings, men at least, men are testosterone-fueled monsters who either want to have sex or kill. Again, think of a Sylvester Stallone movie, right? I mean, it, it's, think of movies. Think, think, of what, think of what sells in movies today, right? 
It's either sex or killing. It's one or the other. And, and this is the Samson character. And you get a sense of the Samson character as a character with no inner life at all. He has no id. He has, he has all id. He's no ego and no super ego. He has no morality except a very crude, you did this to me, I'll get revenge against you. A morality of revenge. He has no restraint of his urges. And most of all, it's all about him. It's all about him. It's all about the pleasing of his immediate urges. The pleasing of his immediate, uh, uh, his, his immediate impulses. There's no inner life to direct him to anything higher. He is this empty man. And, and here's the question that I want to ask as we get to the last piece. I'll be with you in just a second. Here, the question I want to ask, first of all, is why is this in a Bible? But really, here's the really interesting question for you. The question is, the question is, it's, it's given to us as a, as a parody, almost, of masculinity. Because I think what's going on here is, you read this, you say, it doesn't sound biblical, it doesn't sound Jewish. And the reason you feel that way is because the Bible and the later Talmudic tradition creates a different image of masculinity. That what's being debated here is what does it mean to be a real man? I was watching a, t I'll be right with you. I was watching a TV show. Uh, there was a, a, a wonderful, I forgot what it was. It was a documentary about cultural forms in the 50s. And in the 50s, there, were, there was this also a, a resurgence of real manliness. You know, some Mickey Spillane, you know, kind of tough, tough guy. Remember Humphrey Bogart in all those movies, right? Sam Spade, the, the tough guy, the tough man, the real man. When we say somebody's a real man, before feminism was born, this image of the real man and how he treats women and how he treats men, right? And the, the sort of loner, he's always a loner. Think about real men in American movies. Clint Eastwood, a real man. John Wayne, a real man, right? I mean, a real man. Right? Feminism came and offered an alternative, a gentle, the gentle man. But think about the image of the real man. And what are the elements of real man? And, and here's where this becomes critical. You know, this morning we have a bat mitzvah, so it's, it's, not, it's not the appropriate time. But if it was a bar mitzvah, and we're talking to a 13-year-old boy, and we, and we were trying to teach him what it means to be a man. What does it mean to be a man? What are the elements of real manliness? Right? In many cultures, and in American culture at certain moments, the insult, the greatest insult that you could throw at a man was to say, ah, oh, he's a woman. Right? He's, he's, he's acting like a woman. I mean, think about that for a minute. So real manliness is opposed to womanliness, right? To be effeminate is somehow to be lesser. To be lesser. Tough. Real man. Weak. Not so real man, right? You know, powerful, real man. Aggressive, real, assertive, passive. Think about real man. What we, what's being debated here is an image of what it means to be a real man. That's what's, and, and that's what the Samson myths, the Samson myths are incorporated in the conversation because it's, in some ways it's a caricature, it's a parody of a certain ideal of real manliness. And then the question is, well, what's the alternative? What, what do we, how do we respond to this? You had your hand up for a very long time, and I really appreciate your kindness. Okay, we've kind of passed it, but... That's okay. By, when Nazir? Yeah, oh, gosh, yes. You see, but that's what... I, I told you, he's the world's strangest Nazir. He never made the Nazarites promise. It was, he was born with it, right? Number one, right? Number two, he's not supposed to touch dead things. That's all he does, go around killing people. So that's really strange, right? And number three... You would think, you would think that if a person's a Nazarite, you, you associate godliness with a certain gentleness of spirit, and here you associate the Nazarite with this uncontrolled testosterone-fueled, manly aggressive type, right? Ray Rice, you know, you know, play football, then beat up your wife, and then lie about it, right? I mean, it's just, it's just a strange. And that's why I said, I, it's a very strange story, isn't it? It's a very strange story. But it raises the question so clearly. Okay, so if this isn't Jewish manliness, what is? But he's also having a fair amount of sex. Oh, yes. 
a lot of sex and a lot of violence. It's id. It's the I id, id. It's Freudian id. It's, 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 it's you know, it's, it's Playboy magazine. It's Hugh Hefner's fantasy, of, you know, except he lies in bed in his pajamas all day long. You know. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a breed between Hugh Hefner and Sylvester Stallone, you know? Adrian, chonk, you know? <laughs> you, you see, I mean, and, and the reason why I bring up Stallone, or Schwarzenegger for that matter, yeah. Arnold, you know? Let me tell you something. Arnold did not, I shouldn't do that. Arnold did, <laughs> Arnold did not become the highest paid Hollywood actor for his careful, nuanced performance of the human condition. Right? You want the human condition? You know, there's a lot of actors in Hollywood that can do that. Why did Arnold become the highest paid actor in Hollywood? Because he hurt people. He hurt people so, so artfully that we paid him $20 million a picture to hurt people. Even his funny pictures, he hurts people. Because there's a sort of raging violence inside of him in his characters, in all of his characters, that we just love. You know that at some point, Arnold's gonna punch somebody out. You just know it, right? You even watch his funny movies. He, there's a, you know, he made a funny movie called Kindergarten Cop. It's a cute movie. I watched it with my kids. I thought it was gonna be a funny movie. About halfway through, he's beating the snot out of people. I said, TV's going off, kids, you know? That's not the manliness I want you learning. We paid Schwarzenegger more money than anybody in Hollywood because we love watching him destroy people. What the hell is wrong with us? Because there's some kind of repressed masculine need to watch that kind of violence. People were disappointed with the Mayweather-Pacquiao fight, fight, because they didn't beat the crap out of each other. Mayweather's talent as a boxer is that he doesn't get hit. Oh, if that's what I knew, I wouldn't have paid for the pay-per-view, you know? But you see that we want, we want Rocky. We want, you ever watch the Rocky movies? It's a funny parody of boxing. Two great big men stand in the middle and beat the crap out of each other. You know, now it's box by box. I'm giving a sermon and I shouldn't, but I'm having fun with it. Like, <laughs> boxing isn't violent enough for Americans, so we created mixed martial arts. You know, you it's a you, what is it? The best? What is it called? UFW? Or what is it? What is it? What is it? UFC. UFC. Right? Yeah. So two guys now they can kick and scratch and bite and spit. You know, great, wonderful. You know, welcome to America. <laughs> What's going on here? It's a, it's a meditation on what it means to be a real man. And the Bible is, is playing with this notion of masculinity. Now, take a biblical hero and compare. Let's take Moses, for example. What do you get in Moses? So we have this story. Moses grows up in the palace of Pharaoh, right? And, it, and his first episode of adulthood is what? He goes out because he sees the suffering of his people. So right away, you have a quality which you don't have in Samson, which is empathy. He has empathy, right? What happens to Moses, though? He sees the slave master beating the slave, right? And what does he do? He has a moment of Samson in him. He rises up and kills the slave master. How does the Bible feel about that? Well, what happens next? The next day, he encounters two Israelites beating each other. And when he tries to separate them, they say to him, are you going to kill us the way you killed the other guy? And he realizes that, so it, it, the Bible condemns that kind of violence. The ultimate condemnation of that violence is gonna come late in his life, when after he loses his sister, he loses his temper, and God says, talk to the rock, and instead of talking to the rock, he's gonna smack the rock, and God says, you're not gonna go into the land. Because you don't know how to use words. Because I can't have a Sylvester Stallone leading my people. Because you've gotta gain some control over yourself. Because a Jewish man understands that his task in life is to control his urges and sublimate them into societal values. The Midrash, the Talmud has it wonderfully. It says, Ezo Gibor, who is the champion? Hakovesh et Yitzro. It's in, the, it's in Pirkei Avot, chapter 4. It's Hakovesh et Yitzro. The one who has conquered his impulses. Now, it's interesting. It doesn't say, it doesn't say what you think it's going to say. It doesn't say ha'oker et yitzro, one who uproots his impulse. The impulse itself is not evil. The impulse to violence is not evil. The impulse to sexuality is not evil. The impulse to acquisition is not evil. It's only evil when 
it goes wild. It needs to be sublimated and regulated. So the impulse of sexuality is regulated and sublimated into a responsible relationship called kiddushin, called marriage. Think nuclear energy. The splitting of an atom releases unimaginable energy. If it's not contained, it can destroy Hiroshima and Nagasaki. What do you do? You put it in a bottle. If you build a strong enough bottle, what can you do? You can power a city. That's what a nuclear reactor is. It's an atomic bomb in a bottle. If you can control the, the reaction and put it in a strong enough bottle, you can create energy, an, un, an, un, an unlimited amount of energy. Right? That's, that's the image. It's an unlimited amount of energy. You let sexuality out of the bottle, explodes and destroys the society the way nuclear energy will. Violence is the same thing. What do you do with violence in the Jewish tradition? Who's the most violent guy in the Torah? Who? Pinchas is one of them, yes. And what is Pinchas's job? He is a Kohen. Where, who are his ancestors? Remember two sons of Jacob? Shimon and Levi? And their, their sister gets uh, either seduced or raped, depending on which novel you read, right? But, and, and what do they do? They go and they... And they kill, the, they kill all the people of Shechem, right? What happens to... The, Shimon has a different history. What happens to Levi? You take the violence of Levi, and what do you do with it? What, who, be, who is Levi become? Priest. Becomes the priests. Now what does that mean? That somehow priestliness is associated with sublimated violence. Right? You take the aggressiveness of the priest and you channel it into the conduct of the holy precinct. You want to kill things? Great, kill animals. <laughs> he kills, he makes sure, he, he becomes sacrifice. He does sacrifices. In the Talmud, what do they do with aggression? Right? The, the Talmudic world took aggression and turned it into verbal warfare. So Talmudic debate is the sublimation of, you know, it's not, a, not an accident that all the lawyers in the world are Jewish. So the Talmudic debate, Talmudic debate is the sublimation of testosterone into verbal forms. You see? You, you sublimate the, the, the impulses, you, you control the impulses, and they become creative instead of becoming destructive. They become creative instead of becoming destructive. You don't uproot it, you, you sublimate it. What is Samson? He's the unsublimated id. He's Moses without the Torah. He's who Moses would have become without the Torah. Who's La it's what Levi would have become without, without the priesthood. It's the unsublimated aggressiveness of the male. So the question is, what, you know, how do you teach men to be real men, but to give them an image of masculinity that's creative and not destructive? All right, let's see what happens. Because ultimately, the Bible is going to do away with this guy, because it's going to prove to you that it's self-destructive. This part you all know. By the way, just as an aside, you don't mind on one more digression. The movie, Victor Mature and Hedy Lamar. Made in 1959, 1960, right? Cecil B. DeMille. Early 50s, right. Here's what's interesting. She was Jewish and he wasn't. Samson and Delilah. It's, again, a really good, bad movie. Okay? And I think it's been color. Was it in color or was it colorized? It's a pretty bad color, right? Victor Mature is it? Victor Mature. And Hedy Lamar, right? And at the end, he pulls down the. It's, it's great. And I'm, I'm watching, I watched the movie. And at the end, I'm watching, I just was watching the credits. You know who has the screenplay, screenplay credit for that movie? This, it blew my mind. Vladimir Jabotinsky. Ah, so who is Vladimir Jabotinsky? First of all, he died 10 years before the movie was made. Yes. David Ben-Gurion, or Herzl's, Herzl's nemesis. The great Zionist Herzl. His nemesis was a man named Vladimir Jabotinsky, who was a Zionist, or Zionist philosopher who believed that the problem with the Jewish people was that generations and generations of enforced passivity had taken out of Jewish men all their manliness. And he wanted us to return to Eretz Yisrael and become real strong men again. He, ever see the movie The Zohan? That's the, that's the, that's the caricature of that. Right? Part, one theme of Zionism was to return to Jewish men their real manliness. The, the, Begin is Jabotinsky's student, his chassid, his disciple. 
By the way, Jabotinsky had another disciple who was equally important but didn't get as much press. His name was Ben Sion Netanyahu. Ben Sion Netanyahu became a famous historian of Jewish persecution, and his son, Benjamin Netanyahu, is the prime minister of the state of Israel. So he's the grand student of Jabotinsky. Jabotinsky, who worshipped Jewish strength and wanted to return us to power, wrote a novel called Samson and Delilah that Cecil B. DeMille based the screenplay of the movie on. So the movie is, even though Jabotinsky died 10 years before the movie was made, he gets the screenplay credit for the movie. Because this was the Jabotin, now, now again, you, so you know a little bit about Zionism, right? A little bit about Zionism, right? Before the state of Israel, the holiday of Hanukkah was all about lighting candles and the light that burned eight nights. It was the Zionists who turned the Maccabees back into somebody important, right? They made Maccabee strength. They worshiped the strength of the Maccabees, you see? So the Samson myth becomes part of the Zionist lore because it's a returning of the, it's, it's like we, we, we Jews began become making gentlemen. And we were proud that we made gentlemen, but we went too far in making gentlemen. They became too gentle. They became too passive. They became too meek. They became too soft. So the Zionists came to correct that. Make us back into real men. I don't know how many of you had, had Moshe Dayan posters in your bedroom. 1967, Six Day War. It was the last day the big kids in my gym class beat me up. Because <laughs> after that, you Jews are tough. I said, you damn right, you better be careful, right? <laughs> and I, got, I didn't get beat up in gym class anymore. It was a machaya, and I put a big poster of Moshe Dayan in my bedroom because he was a badass Jew, and I had never met a badass Jew. All the Jews I met were these really soft European rabbis, right? A badass Jew is great, right? Eye patch, machine gun, women on each side, you know? It was great. So now the question is, are you playing with images of masculinity? Everybody see that? All right, let's do the last one. We've got to do this. Have some fun. After that, so here's the end of the story. Ready? He fell in love with a, Woody in, a woman in Wadi Sarek. Be careful of the women of Wadi Sarek. Oh, God. Her name was Delilah. The lords of the Philistine went up to her and said, coax him to find out what makes him so strong. Now, by the way, not only do we have a meditation here on masculinity, there's also a meditation on women here. What's the role of women in this story? They're all sex objects. They have no inner life. They're just, they're, out, they're outsides. Sports Illustrated, right? Because he, he doesn't like fall in love with these people. He just falls in love with their bodies, right? And then they end up being manipulative. All the women are manipulative. So part of the real man is to be very suspicious of women. Yes, yes, really, really traitorous, right? Again, think Humphrey Bogart movies, right? Well, darling, you know? We should go back to wearing hats, by the way, don't you think? That's the one part of that, that era that I really like, or the hat. Don't you think they were, remember that? Right? It's the Maltese Falcon, you know? <laughs> okay. The lords of the Philistines said, coax him and find out what makes him so strong we can overpower him. Tie him up, make him helpless and we'll give, each, we'll give you 1,100 shekels. So the other, ones, they, the other woman, they threatened her family. This one, they want to pay off. So Delilah said to Samson, tell me what makes you so strong and how you could be tied up and made helpless. <laughs> now, any woman who asks you that, <laughs> you know, gentlemen, I mean, come on. I mean, like, maybe, like, if you had any brains at all, you'd say, like, maybe you'd like, like, maybe worry about this a minute? Yes, I am. Is that what? Fifty shades of, uh, yeah, fifty shades of gray, right. Samson replied, if I had tied up with fresh tendons that had not been dried, I'd become weak as an ordinary man. So the Lord of the Philistine brought up seven fresh tendons, and I'll be ready. She bound them while an ambush was waiting in her room, and she called out, Samson, Samson, the Philistines are upon you. Whereat he pulled the tendons apart as a strand of tow comes upon a touch of fire, which I don't understand at all, but fine. So the secret of his strength remained unknown. And you think he would have said, hmm, about this girl, but no, because he's too stupid, you know. I mean, the, this, the, the Bible's also enjoying his stupidity. His, not its stupidity, he's like so easily seduced, that's what it is, right? The real man turns out to be very weak, that's the point. He may be physically strong, but he's mentally very soft. 
right? Rocky Balboa, okay? You deceived me, you lied to me. Do tell me how you could become tied up. And he says, okay, if you bound me with new ropes that I haven't been used. So she took new ropes. Samson, Samson, the Philistines are upon you. He tore them off like a thread. She said to him, how can you say you love me? <laughs> when you don't confide in me. <laughs> you never listen. All right. Uh, this makes three times you've deceived me. I, there's another one in there, which I took out, because you get the point, right? And you haven't told me what makes you so. Finally, after she nagged him and pressed him constantly. So it's interesting. There's no physical threat in the world that can overcome him. What, but the only thing that can overcome him is, is female nagging, which is a really ugly image of men and women and how they relate to each other. It's just awful. It's, and he confides to her, no razor has ever touched my head, for I've been a Nazarite to God since I was in my mother's womb. If my hair were cut, my strength would leave me, and I should become as weak as an ordinary man. Sensing that, he confided to everything. To, she sent for the lords. The Philistines come up one more time. He confided in me. The lords came up. They brought money. She lulled him to sleep. She called in a man. They cut off the seven locks of his head. She weakened him, made him helpless. His strength slipped away from him. She cried, Samson, the Philistines are upon you. And he awoke from his sleep thinking he would break loose and shake himself free as the other times, for he didn't know that the Lord had departed from him. He never knew that the Lord was even with him. We know that, but he didn't know that. The Philistines seized him and gouged out his eyes, and they brought him down to Gaza and shackled him in bronze fetters, and he became a mill slave in the prison. After his hair cut off, it began to grow back. Now the lords of the Philistines gathered to offer great sacrifice to their god, Dagon. Dagon is a fish god, okay, because they're fishermen. And made merry. As their spirits rose, they said, call Samson here and let him dance for us. Samson was fetched from prison and danced for them. They put him in pill between the pillars. Samson said to the boy who was leading him by the hand, let go of me and let me feel the pillars and th that the temple rests upon, that I may lean on them. Now the temple was full of men and women. All the lords of Philistine were there, and there were some 3,000 men and women on the roof watching Samson dance. Samson called up to the Lord, O Lord God, please remember me and give me strength just this once, O God, to take revenge on the Philistines, if only for one of my two eyes. So it's still about what? It's still about him. It's still his own, his own struggle. It's not about anything bigger than that. He embraced the two pillars of the temple rested on, one on his right, one on his left, leaned against them. Samson cried, let me die with the Philistines. And he pulled with all his might. The temple came crashing down on the lords and all the people in it. Those who were slain by him as he died outnumbered those who'd been slain by him when he lived. And the, the next paragraph says his family found his body among the wreckage and they buried him. He'd been in Israel for 20 years. All right, what do we get at the end? What's the moral of the story? The strong man, it's like, it's one of those riddles again, right? The strong man is really weak. No adversary could overcome him except for the women he could not let go of because he was so, he was enslaved to this, to his women. He was enslaved to his lusts. He was enslaved to his desires. So in fact, he was not the strongest man. He was the weakest of men. He was the weakest of men, right? No blue dress, but you get the picture, right? You, I mean, you can have the outward appearance of great power, authority, and strength, but he's the weakest of men because he could not control his desires and his impulses, number one. And number two, the real interesting question is, what does it mean to be a real man? And so the Bible will respond to this with a different, with an alternative vision of masculinity. And not just the Bible, but even more so, the rabbinic tradition. The gentle masculinity. Gentle masculinity. Cerebral masculinity. Empathetic masculinity. And the relationship between men and women, instead of being manipulative and treasonous, and, and, and destructive becomes supportive and, 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 and holy. And Samson becomes the image of all that we're not. Because the ultimate moral of the story is that this, this vision of masculinity will eventually cause its own self-destruction. You can't build a society around characters like this. You can't build human life around characters like this because there's no inner life because there's something vital missing from this human being. It might be the fantasy, which is why Schwarzenegger makes movies. It might be the fantasy, which is why Playboy magazine still sells. 
It might be the fantasy, but in fact, it is ultimately self-destructive. And so the Bible then seeks, and the Talmud, and even more so, seeks an alternative vision of what it means to be a man. So the little fellow who sits on the bima and, you know, squeaks out, you know, today I am a man, and we make fun of him. But something very powerful is happening. Because when we, what are we saying to him at that point? You are bar mitzvah. What makes you a man? What is the essence of your masculinity? Mitzvah. What makes you a man is your capacity to, to rise up spiritually and do acts in the world of, of healing and redemption. To, to, be, to be obligated by a code, of, a, a code of law that has obligated Jewish men for 3,000 years to participate in God's world as God's vessels of blessing in the world. That's what makes you a real man. That's the, real, that's what, that's the essence of bar mitzvah. That's the real essence of bar mitzvah. Stu. What you say is true, but... Again, Thank you. <laughs> it, 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 went, it went too far. And right, that's my point. Some people feel that, be, that not seeing the Holocaust and everything was because of this, and then Israel and the Six-Day War sort of created a balance back in the Right, so, so, so the, 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 the history of this is that so, so it, 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 it went too far, meaning we took this notion of... of the, the notion that the rabbis created was still an active character. And Moses rises up and smites the Egyptian because he's active. His empathy leads him to action. The question is, by the end of the, by, by, by you know, generations and generations of galut, of exile, create gentlemen who are weak and passive. And the Zionists critique, the Zionists come and they criticize traditional Jewish versions of masculinity because we're weak and passive. And they seek to give us back a strong, assertive Jewish male. But the Zionists went too far on the other side. That's again, I like movies, so the Zohan. This notion of Gever, you know, the tough Israeli, Moshe Dan becomes a tough Israeli with no bounds. That's why the president of Israel, the former president of Israel is in jail. Why is the former president of Israel in jail? For sexual harassment of his female assistants. Why did he think he could get away with that? Because he's a gever, because he's a man. The Israeli, mascul the Israeli masculinity goes to, back to the Samson model. Jabotinsky got what he asked for. He got all of the power of the Samson model and all of its self-destructiveness. All of its self-destructiveness. So now you're seeking balance. That's, that's where we are today. You're seeking some kind of image of, of, image of, of proper ethical masculinity, right? And I, and I think America, and, and, and the reason why I talk about these movies is because I still, I think American men are seeking it as well, right? We're seeking sort of images of, of, of power and, and, and strength without passivity, but ethical masculinity. David. You know, the final scene when he pulls the down. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. But it reminds me of that horrible tragedy that occurred in the Mediterranean when that boat sank and the the captain actually escaped. Yeah. And he was like an ant he was like a Samson character. Oh, it was worse. The reason he steered the boat into the rocks, remember? He was trying to impress his girlfriend, remember? That you're exactly right. Well, it's, a, it's a Samson <laughs> Right. It's a, an indication of Samson like behavior, but he got out of the way. Yeah. Thing. Yeah. And no, no sense of responsibility or empathy or. Uh, well, that, no, it's not what it was. The, when the, when, the, when the, the cruise ship hit, in a, a cruise ship hit in the Mediterranean, hit those rocks. Rabbi, when you talk about passivity, it's even beyond that because you gave the example a couple of months ago during the Holocaust where those guys not only watched their wives and daughters get raped and yeah. tortured, right. they hit, but when they were done, they ran to the rabbi, what's the kosher rule now? Right, that was Bialik's poem. That's Bialik's poem about the Kishinev pogrom. And, and that is one of the most angry rejections of the passivity of the galut male, the, the exiled Jewish male who's become meek and passive. Right. And the other thing you talked about, the right. guy who ran around, the rabbi who wrote a 420-page book right. to give Amantashen out properly. Right. Which is not mitzvot, it's beyond. Right, which is, with the fact is that, that in certain circles we've never shaken that kind of, you know, that kind of strange masculinity. Of, no empathy. 
Right, there's no empathy and there's no sense of responsibility. Yes, Bobby. Um, briefly, it, in, in American society, which you were alluding to with our, the kind of movies that we seem to like, and that, um, that uh, I'm wondering, as we become, we became a superpower, we became the only superpower, it's questionable going forward where we are right. within the power structure of the world. How do you, how would you suggest as a rabbi uh -huh. preventing um, yeah. uh, the, the American male culture to be so um, <laughs> afraid? I'll tell you what I'm going to do. Power. I'm going to get into trouble no matter what I say to answer that. <laughs> but, but here's what I will suggest. We, we have a presidential campaign coming. I, you, may, you may have heard of that, right? <laughs> We have, uh, right, as of today, we have three, three Democrats and 55 Republicans running for president. Listen to the rhetoric. Forget the policy. Just listen to the rhetoric. And you'll hear, and I'm not commenting, I'm not partisan, you know me, I love every Jew, right? I, I love all Americans. Listen to the ones who say, his foreign policy was meek, weak, and passive. We have to get tough. I've heard that a lot already. You know, we have to get, we have to be real, we have to be tough. And then, you know, the, the reporter, if there's a reporter there, will say, you know, do you recommend boots on the ground? Oh, no, 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 no. But, but the, the, the image, of the, there's, a, there's, a, there's a real, I think you're, you're exactly right. In, in American culture, I, I'm talking politics, for example, you really have this, this whole question being played out. What does it mean to be a real American? He's Harvard trained, weak, you know, she man, you know, girly man, you know, we are tough Americans, right? That's why I think a lot of people wanted Arnold to be governor, because they wanted a tough American, yeah, you know, we don't get pushed around well, by Enron, you know? So you, you'll, hear that in the camp, you'll hear that in the campaign. You'll hear this in the, in the political campaign, right? And it makes it really interesting that one of the principal candidates is a woman, and there's going to be a lot of questions about, is she tough enough? That's what that's it. But but that's the question. You see, she does she is she and this and you're playing with these images now. Exactly right. You're playing and think again. I tell you, I like movies. So if you think again about movie characters, who the real men in movies are, right? The Clint Eastwoods and the you know, Sylvester Stallones and the Schwarzeneggers, and then you get other characters. You get we have we we do have gentle characters. We do have the the Dustin Hoffmans of the world, right? You know, and so it's really interesting to me to see how American culture is playing this out as well. 